to God be the glory. When I was dating my wife, she taught a song to me I'd never heard before. It's a beautiful song. I'll put Jesus first in my life. I love the message of that song. It reflects what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 and verse 33. The Apostle Paul would say, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. And so it's Paul in Colossians 3 and 4 that points us to putting Jesus first. Let's look at that today. Once when I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the International Spy Museum near Chinatown. And while I learned that espionage is an ancient game, most of the exhibit covered the last 100 years. There was one whole section that covered the Cold War. This period of espionage developed its own Ten Commandments, the so-called Moscow Rules. Assume nothing. Don't look back. Maintain a natural pace. And if it feels wrong, it is wrong. Those rules are still used by spies all around the world today. And many of the rules boil down to trusting your instincts. While we have a conscience, sometimes we try to trust our instincts rather than train our instincts with the Word of God. Hebrews 5.14 tells us that it's the mature that have done that by reason of their knowledge of God's Word. And thankfully, God has given us some clear rules for some of our most basic relationships. I like what the Apostle Paul has to say in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 18. He says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and in the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in all things. You know, Paul builds a masterful case in this letter to the Colossians for why we should put Jesus above everything else. And even in this short paragraph, look at several reasons why Christ should be put above all. First, there is his heroic work. In verse 13 and 14, the apostle Paul tells us, he rescued us, he transferred us, he redeemed us, and he forgave us. Another reason why Christ should be put before all in this paragraph is His supernatural identity. Look at what verse 15 through 17 says. He is the exact visible picture of God. He is over all creation as the creator of all and the sustainer of all. And then third, He should be put above all because of His authoritative position. Verse 18 tells us, He is the head of the church. And he is the first one to overcome death. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23, he's the first fruits of them that sleep. You know, for these reasons and more, which the rest of the epistle of Colossians shows us, Jesus will come to have first place in everything. And for that reason, Jesus should come to have first place in every part of my life. You know, that leaves no part uncovered, no part unaddressed. It is every person, place, or thing that confronts us in this life, and that includes every relationship that we form and maintain. Later on in the letter to the Colossians, Paul is discussing what my life is supposed to look like if I have been raised with Christ. That starts in Colossians 3 and verse 1. If you be raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. For your life is hidden in Christ, who is raised from the dead. This should look dramatically and positively in a way that it's going to affect my life. It's going to affect my moral conduct. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 11. It should also dramatically and positively affect my interaction with other Christians as I look in Colossians 3, verse 12 through 17. It should dramatically and positively affect my interaction inside of my own home, Colossians 3, verse 18 through 21. 
And it should dramatically and positively affect my interaction on the job. Colossians 3.22 through Colossians 4 and verse 1. It should also dramatically and positively affect my interaction with outsiders, those who are of the world and who are not in the body of Christ, Colossians 4, 2 through 6. So let's think about that. That's my relationship with myself, my relationship with the church. It's my relationship with my spouse, with my parents, with my children, with my coworkers, and with my world. As far as I can tell, that's a pretty comprehensive, exhaustive list of every person's relationships. That's the horizontal ones. Paul started with the vertical one. But we live in a world in which as we maintain that vertical relationship, we've got to improve those horizontal relationships. And in doing so, it's the way that we keep that vertical relationship right. We keep Christ first. In each relationship, Paul gives us a word to encourage us in how to keep Jesus first in every horizontal relationship. I'd like you to notice those with me. First, Paul speaks to wives, and he says, You keep Jesus first in your life by being submissive to your husband. That's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. Paul first addresses married Christian women, and he discusses with them what is proper or appropriate for them. There are some things that don't fit right. You ever tried to use a metric socket on an english size bolt head, or have you seen poor water connections between galvanized and copper pipes or plastic and metal pipes that they tried to join together? Or maybe you've gone to the paint store and tried to match the green paint in your living room from 1968, and you found a color that was close. And most of us have encountered situations like this where we ran into something that wasn't a good match. The word Paul uses here for what is fitting concerns what matches, what is proper, and what's correct. It's a word that you find other places in the New Testament. We're told in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4 that filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting just doesn't fit for somebody who's trying to imitate God. And in Philemon 8, Paul says what was fit for Philemon, who owed his salvation to Paul, was for him to forgive his runaway slave Onesimus at Paul's request. So what fits right in this passage is for a wife to be subject to her own husband. In Ephesians 5 and verse 22, Paul says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 2, the apostle Peter says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. One thing that Paul and Peter in these three verses tie together is how this command to submit to her husband is a conscious decision to honor the Lord. It's done in His sight, and it's unto Him. Now, it's not how a woman would naturally or easily conduct herself with her husband. It's not how her friends or how her culture or society would counsel her to conduct herself. But there are legitimate biblical reasons why God has the relationship set up this way. You know, submission exists between the Father and Son and what the Bible reveals about God. Though Jesus taught others that He was equal to God in John 5, 18, He also taught in John 14 and verse 28, the Father is greater than I. There was a submission that Jesus offered up to the Father, Hebrews 5, 7, and 8. He is God, Jesus is, Philippians 2, 6 says as much, but He emptied Himself and He humbled Himself only to be exalted by the Father, Philippians 2, 7 through 9. Listen, Jesus is not less God, nor is He inferior. Father and Son simply occupy different roles and they have different responsibilities. Submission does not suggest that the man is worth more, is smarter or better qualified to lead than the woman or in any way superior to her. God simply created men and women with different needs. Men need to feel respected by their wives, and women need to feel loved by their husbands. It's in our nature. And since God knows that, best of all, He directs us accordingly. God is a God of order, and He is best qualified to tell us how each person operates best according to His design. That's the word for wives. But then second, 
Paul speaks to husbands about their horizontal relationship, and he says that they keep Jesus first by loving their wives. That's Colossians 3.19. There's a sense in which both husbands and wives are to submit to one another, Ephesians 5.21. Men can easily misunderstand what Paul says about headship and submission and abuse the Scriptures and run over his wife. But marriage is an agreement between two equals to both submit to God's plan to please Him. You know, many translations render Colossians 3.19 by saying, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Some have the word embittered, and this word means to cause bitter feelings. I don't think that Paul is warning the husband to love his wife and to avoid being embittered against her. It seems that Paul is warning him to love her so fully and genuinely that she will not feel bitter toward him. But truthfully, love will prevent both types of bitterness. In 1 Corinthians 7.33, Paul writes that a married man is concerned about how he can please his wife. In Colossians 3.19, he warns against a man forgetting that his wife needs to be made to feel that she is special and adored. And of course, this is not simply an emotional exercise. Paul helps us by defining love for us in what he writes to the Corinthians. You know those passages, perhaps. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. About 10 years ago, there was a shooting at a Safeway grocery store in Tucson, Arizona, and the most famous casualty was Congresswoman Gabrielle Gefford's But six people were also killed and 13 were wounded. And one of the deceased was a man named Dorwin Stoddard, a 76-year-old retired construction worker who was at the store with his wife, Maybe. And when gunshots started, Maybe thought it was fireworks, but Dorwin knew what it was. And he pulled her down and he landed on top of her. They were members of the Mountain Avenue Church of Christ in Tucson. And Maybe told her preacher, Dorwin saved my life. I don't suppose that there's a man listening to this who would say that he wouldn't do just what Dorwin did for maybe if that was the only option that he had, that we would lay down our lives for our wives. But what God's Word says is that God expects so much more of us than just that. God wants us to sacrifice ourselves for our wives every day, willing to go to the extent that Christ did in His love for His bride. But there's so much more that Jesus does for His bride. She occupies his interest and his energy. I wonder how many women are there in marriages where their husbands have provided for every material want or need that they have, but who would trade it all for being loved and cherished like Christ does the church. What a challenge to us as husbands. We keep Jesus first by loving our wives. But then third, children keep Jesus first by obeying their parents, Colossians 3.20. Just how important is this to God? Disobedience of parents is a sign of a depraved mind which does improper things worthy of death, Romans 1 and verse 30. It is a sign of dangerous times in the last days, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. But what does it mean to be disobedient to parents? It's interesting to hear what the world's experts tell us and the labels that they give disobedience without condition. They say it's called Oppositional Defiant Disorder, ODD, or Antisocial Personality Disorder, ASPD, or Emotional Behavioral Disorder, EBD. And while I recognize that I'm not a clinician or even a licensed professional counselor, I'm a father of three grown sons, and I've been ministering to people my uh, entire adult life. Is it possible that in some, maybe even in a majority of cases, that we're simply dealing with disobedient children and adults not willing to expend the attention, energy, and difficulty that comes in molding and shaping undeveloped minds and inexperienced lives. It is hard to make children mind. It's hard to engage in a battle of wills. Disobedience can be defined by its synonyms in Scripture. Disobedience is an attitude of unrighteousness, Luke 1.17. It's following your own thoughts, Isaiah 65 and verse 2. It's refusing to listen to instruction, Isaiah 30 and verse 9. The question is, does God expect children to obey their parents? 
You know, the old law says yes. Exodus 20 and verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. That's the fifth commandment. And the second part is why Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 calls it the first command with a promise. The long-term success of our children depends on their being obedient to their parents. Leviticus 19, 13 says, reverence your parents. Deuteronomy 27, 13 says, cursed is he who dishonors his parents. The Proverbs are full of statements about listening to parents, honoring and obeying them, loving and respecting them. Proverbs 29, 15 says, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Obedience involves training. Children don't possess that naturally without guidance. And so Jesus comes along and he teaches the importance of truly honoring parents in Matthew 15, 4 and Matthew 19, 19. And Paul reinforces his Lord's thinking in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. And then right here in Colossians 3, verse 20. You see, parents are responsible for setting expectations and for showing right and wrong. And children are responsible for following them. And then fourth, Paul speaks to parents and he says, you keep Jesus first by encouraging your children. Colossians 3.21. He makes it clear that there's more to the parent-child relationship than a list of rules and regulations. He addresses his father specifically, even though the principle is applied to both parents throughout the Bible. How are parents to interact with children who are faced with the necessity of obedience? Well, they're to be supportive and encouraging, which is suggested in the warning that Paul gives. He, doesn't, he says, don't exasperate them or provoke them. And he also says that a failure in this leads to their losing heart and being discouraged. What's the opposite of discouraged? Isn't it hopeful, happy, confident, and courageous? As parents, we can act like our children never measure up and they can't gain our approval. We're doing this if we withhold affection to try and manipulate or to control them. We're doing this if we only praise them if they succeed and not if they try their hardest but still fall short. And especially if we fail to notice the progress that they're making, we're doing this if we ridicule them or constantly contradict them, especially publicly and in front of their friends. We're in an ideal situation to teach our children about the fatherhood of God by our example. As Christians, we're trying to instill something in our children that they cannot get anywhere else but in Christ. We're aiming for more than self-confidence, but confidence in God that helps them through their biggest challenges. We're aiming for so much more than mere happiness, but a happiness that comes in serving and praising God. And we're showing them that they cannot find true happiness in money, pleasure, occupation, or worldly acceptance. And so as parents, we should ask, how can I be more like my father in heaven in dealing with my own children? Don't misuse your authority in this relationship with your child. Make sure that you're modeling the happiness and confidence that you have in God and how it helps you to live each day. There should be no doubt in our children's minds that Jesus is first in the relationship that we have with them. Often the Bible tells us to act like our Heavenly Father. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Luke 6, 36. God says, you shall be holy as I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 16. We put Jesus first in our relationship with our children by making sure that they can see Him in what we say and do. Number five, Employees keep Jesus first by serving their employers. That's Colossians 3, 22 through 25. Between a third and a half of all Romans were slaves. So we're not off base to see this command as instruction for employees in today's world. As much as any of these relationships, this one is to be guided by our relationship with Christ. Paul mentions the Lord four times in these four verses. So how do we keep Jesus first in our relationship with earthly masters? Number one is compliance. Verse 22, obey them in all things. Literally, follow instructions and be subject to them. Pay attention to them. Think about how out of step with our culture that attitude is. Number two, an honest work ethic. Verse 22, you don't just perform when you're being watched. You're driven by sincerity and a fear of the Lord. You're not doing your work to show off or to win praise from your boss. You want God to be pleased. Stanford Graduate School of Business professor Jeff Pfeffer says that many workers are strategic and calculating about who they will help based on how important the person is to the future they have on the job. So they will do things for their boss that they wouldn't do for their coworker because of what the boss can do for them. Paul says Christians don't do that. Number three, work heartily. Verse 23 through 25, literally 
from your soul. You're working for more than a paycheck. You're working for a heavenly inheritance. That will revolutionize the way we work. And it will certainly make us a more valuable employee, but it will also help us through difficult times on the job, reminding ourselves it's the Lord Christ that you serve. We serve our employer because of who we are, not because of who they are. And then number six, employers keep Jesus first by fairly treating their employees. Colossians 4.1. As with the parent-child relationship, the employer-employee relationship works both ways. The employer has a responsibility to the employee as great as the employee does to them. Treat all your workers justly and fairly and avoid favoritism. You have an ultimate master and you want him to treat you justly and fairly. So Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 7, With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. If Jesus is truly first in your life, there are tangible ways for your employees to see that. Do you threaten to punish them or fire them as a means of manipulating them? Do you use your position to bully them? How tragic if someone forgot Christ in their business and discouraged their employers from seeing Him. And finally, Christians keep Jesus first by ministering to their neighbors. That's Colossians 4, 2 through 6. You know, Jesus was a soul winner. It was his very mission, Luke 19 and verse 10. It's why he preached to and reached the masses and so many types of individuals, rich young rulers, wealthy corrupt businessmen, prominent religious leaders, adulterers, prostitutes, and a variety of strugglers. And he always seemed to know how to relate to people. And he had the right word for every occasion. You know, there are three vital elements in Colossians 4, 2 through 6 that we need to be like Jesus and to keep Him first as we minister to our neighbors outside of Christ. The first is prayer. Colossians 4, 2 through 4. And that prayer should be alert, thankful, unselfish, and specific. Our work as soul winners is incomplete unless and until our prayer life is engaged in the process. You know, Jesus prayed for souls. John 17, 20 and 21 And He desires us to be praying for those who are lost. In the wake of Israel's sin against God and asking for a king, God's answer with thunder and rain, and they're pleading with Samuel to pray for them, I want you to notice what he said. In 1 Samuel 12, 23, he said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. How many doors have closed? How many Bible studies have failed? And how many opportunities were missed because we have not prayed about it? The second element is conduct. Colossians 4, 5. This is a final uh, in a series of exhortations in Colossians to walk a certain way. In Colossians 1, 10, Paul tells them to properly walk in relationship to their own spiritual lives. And in chapter 2 and verse 6, he tells them to properly walk in their relationship to the Lord and their master. And now in this verse, he tells them to properly walk in relationship to the lost in this world. Is Paul encouraging more just a a simple tactfulness and a careful avoidance of anything offensive? Not only does that not harmonize with the message of Colossians where Paul warns about false teachers, but it's at odds with the militancy and the boldness of the early Christians. But it also does not encourage boisterous bullying behavior. Read Ephesians 4.15 or 2 Timothy 2.24-26. Paul points out at least three major elements of this walk or conduct. It requires wisdom. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. It's a key word in the epistle, wisdom is. We should ask more than if a word or deed or attitude is right or wrong. We should ask, is it wise? Number two, it's seen by outsiders. How many good sermons have been eclipsed by a foolish walk from the preacher or the member? And number three, it necessitates seizing the opportune time. Our job is to think souls and to see opportunities where we are every day. And then the third element of being conducting ourselves right with our neighbors is speech. Colossians 4 and verse 6. Our speech should be gracious, delicious, and judicious. That means that we'll consider our words carefully before we speak to the lost. We'll speak words that attract the lost. And I have right words for the right occasion. Paul's not hinting at compromising the truth. 
He's saying we should be very careful about how we say what we say. Simply giving thought to how we share the truth can make all the difference in how people hear us. So often we talk about the sinful abuse of the tongue in James chapter 3, for example. And while that's needed, we also need to understand the importance of using the tongue positively. In Ephesians 4.29, Paul says, Let no unwholesome speech proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, the prophet says, But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. Or as Paul says elsewhere, If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I'm under compulsion, and woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.16 His residency card and his nation's official documents say his birthday was December 31st, 1870, almost three weeks before Germany became a nation, five years after the Civil War ended, 33 years before the airplane was invented, and when America was less than a century old. But Imbogotho died in 2017, making him 146. What's it like to live almost a century and a half? To put that in perspective, Methuselah lived almost seven times longer than that. He was a contemporary with Adam and Shem, a period of 1,600 years. You know, most of us make decisions like we'll live forever, but these men show us we don't. The dust shall return to the earth as it came from it. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. So when we look at our life, however short or how long we live, the most important decision that we will ever make is putting Jesus first in everything, including our relationships. And you'll notice that in all those horizontal relationships, whether it's the wife to the husband, the husband to the wife, the children to the parents, the parents to the children, the worker to the boss, the boss to the worker, or the Christian with the world. God's laid out a blueprint for us. To be right with Him, we've got to be right with one another. Let's put Jesus first in every relationship.